Why does it seem like France has started to hate airlines and aviation lately? And if they really do, would it be possible to change their mind? France has officially banned short-distance domestic flights in an effort to cut the country's carbon emission. Also, what does any of that have to do with trains in the United States? Stay tuned. The Paris Air Show normally takes place every two years. It was cancelled in 2021 but returned in June 2023 and by all accounts it was an enormous success with huge aircraft orders and loads of interesting new technology on display. But over the past few years, as I'm sure that you've all noticed, more and more voices have been calling loudly for restrictions on air travel on environmental grounds. And a lot of those voices, as well as some very real legal moves, have actually been coming from France. Now, as I've explained in many of my previous videos, aircraft and their engines have constantly become more and more efficient over time. Only in the Boeing 737 family, the efficiency gains that Boeing's made in the 737 MAX over the NG are around 15%. And I can tell you myself that when you compare the fuel part of a flight plan from a MAX to an NG, you wouldn't believe your eyes sometimes. And that's just over one generation of the 737, with other more modern designs like the Airbus A220 or wide bodies like the Boeing 787 and the Airbus A350, the improvements have been even bigger than that. Globally, the contribution of air transport to CO2 emissions is at around 2%, and if we factor in other non-CO2 effects, commercial aviation stands for between 4 and 5% of global emissions. But of course, it's not that simple. This is a long and complicated debate, but as Björn Färm over in Liham News have pointed out, we're talking about a really small part of human activity here. Manufacturing industries like the cement and steel industry can reduce global CO2 emissions way more than aviation ever would, and the same goes for ground and sea transport as well. Also, a lot of the criticism on the aviation industry tends to ignore how efficient airliners already are, at least compared to pretty much everything else. Just to give you an example, let's look at normal cars. As I'm sure you know, electric cars are now getting more and more common, but there are still quite a few challenges that surround them. Those include things like cost, the availability of charging points, as well as the sheer challenge of building out the electrical grid to accommodate the charging of them. Most of those problems are being solved as we speak, but what I want to explain here is the reason that electrical cars are so promising in the first place. And that's simply because cars with internal combustion engines are just so wasteful. Many, many times more wasteful than jet engines are. Björn Färm explains that the efficiency of the engines of a modern single-aisle jet like the 737 or an Airbus A320 is around 40%. And turboprops who have seen less development in recent years have a slightly lower engine efficiency of around 25%. Now, 40 and 25% really doesn't sound like good efficiency numbers, but the efficiency of a conventional car with a normally aspired internal combustion engine is just 5%. This means that 95% of the energy in the car's fuel is lost as heat, straight into nowhere. So with this in mind, it means that a turboprop gets 5 times more energy out of its fuel than your car does, and a modern 737 is up to 8 times more efficient. This is why aviation engineers get a bit frustrated when people point to the transition from fossil fuel cars to electric and say that aviation should just do the same. Basically, the batteries in an electric car only have to replace 5% of the energy from the fuel, whilst batteries in electric aircraft would have to replace up to 8 times that amount, just because the aircraft are already so much more energy efficient. This actually points to the reality here, which is that the aviation industry has been getting its act together on the efficiency front for decades already. And of course, they haven't been doing that out of the goodness of their hearts. Remember, for any airline, their main expense today is fuel. So anything aircraft manufacturers and the airlines can do to minimize that fuel consumption will be done. So reducing fuel burn and reducing carbon emissions go hand in hand. Now, I can't overstate how important this insight is, so I'll say it again. It is in the aviation industry's own purely financial interest to produce as little CO2 with every flight as possible, hence use as little fuel as possible, so the incentives are fully aligned with the environmental movement here. Yes, 
Like I said before, this is a long and complicated debate, but there are also other areas, except for engine and aircraft optimization, where the industry is already making seriously big improvements. That's areas like optimizing air traffic routing to stop planes burning fuel while they circle in holding patterns, and also clever innovations that might enable electric ground taxiing. Now, let me know in the comments below if you would like me to dive more into those developments as well. But having said all of that, there is no question that the aviation industry as a whole is growing. Aircrafts are getting more and more efficient, that's true, but there are also more and more of them flying. And on top of that, aviation is definitely a more visible contributor of CO2 emissions, since we can all see the contrails above us, and because of all of that, it's a contributor that a lot of people want to do something about. That's why there are now so many calls to limit certain types of flights or even to add more conditions on them. And a lot of these calls and initiatives seems to be coming from France lately. But why is that? Why France specifically and what are they doing? Well, I'll tell you that after this. As I'm sure most of you know about me by now is that I'm always on the hunt for the most efficient ways of teaching but also learning new things. And when it comes to language learning, one of the most efficient tools that I've found so far is today's sponsor, Speakly, which I've been using myself to sharpen up my Spanish skills. Speakly will be able to significantly improve your language skills through their special technique of focusing on learning through conversational training and words used in everyday situations, making it feel really relevant and useful. The app offers training in languages like English, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Finnish, Russian and Estonian and it will get you up to usable skills in only a few months provided you spend a few minutes on the app every day. As they say in Spanish, la práctica hace el maestro and with Speakly this has never been more true. Now, you can use Speakly both on your smartphone and your computer giving you tons of flexibility in where you want to practice and if you're interested in trying it out, you will get a 7-day free trial if you use the link here in the description below. And you will also get an incredible 60% discount of your yearly subscription if you choose to sign up. Muchas gracias, Speakly. Y ahora seguimos con el video. So exactly what is France up to? Well, earlier this year, the French Parliament approved a bill that would ban short-haul flights if there is a railway route available that can handle the same journey in two and a half hours or less. Implementing a restriction like this legally was a relatively novel idea and there was a lot of interest from other parts of Europe when the law passed. France is a part of the European Union and in case you didn't know, some national laws can actually be challenged in the EU and therefore possibly be overturned. So when France first proposed the introduction of this law to ban flights in favor of railways, a number of airlines obviously challenged it in the European courts. These airlines felt that the French government was effectively sponsoring the country's railway companies with this move and were letting them pay the bill. But interestingly here, the European courts actually sided with France since they felt that the arguments on environmental grounds actually made sense to them. And also, there were already moves in France and other places in Europe to increase competition on the railways, which theoretically took away some of the arguments about favoring individual rail companies. All these moves back and forth in the court started already in 2020. A first bill was voted favorably in 2021 and when the green light from the European court removed the last possible hurdle late in 2022, the ban on short flights could finally go ahead and it became official law last May. But by the time this initiative became an actual law, it had lost a lot of its original teeth and now basically no one really likes it and here's why. The airlines obviously doesn't like it, because it sets a precedent that other countries in Europe and elsewhere could eventually follow, at least in some form. But environmentalists also don't like it, because the ban didn't actually change anything. Initially, those calling for the law wanted flights banned if the trains could make the same trip in 6 hours, but that threshold was later brought down to 4 and then to 3 hours, which looked like it might stick for a while. Even three hours would have been enough to cover some very popular routes between French cities like Paris and Marseille, which is situated in the south of France, but with the current two and a half hour limitation, even those trips are not affected. The law also have quite a few other limitations, which effectively works as exceptions. 
One important condition of the flight ban is that after getting to a given destination by train in two and a half hours, people should then be able to spend eight hours there before catching another train to get back to their city of origin. And if that's not possible, well then flights are allowed. That rule seems to be targeting people who are currently commuting to work by air, but there are also other exceptions, like one specifically for flights going to and from Charles de Gaulle airport, which means that it will remain a key domestic hub. And of course, the law also doesn't apply to international flights. All in all, these restrictions mean that in practice, the law only restricts three routes, from Paris Orly Airport to Bordeaux to Lyon and Nantes. And actually even that is debatable, because by the time the law came into effect, those flights weren't even operated anymore. The airline that used to fly on these three routes was Air France, either directly or through their regional subsidiary, HOP. Air France itself is part of the Air France KLM group and during the pandemic Air France and KLM both needed bailouts from the French and Dutch governments to stay afloat. One of the conditions that the French government put in place before giving out those bailout loans was that Air France needed to stop some short-haul flights for environmental reasons. Remember, for much of 2020 any flying still going on was done at a great loss anyway, so this was a pretty easy decision for Air France. They cut those flights immediately and the French government then stopped other airlines from stepping in to fill the void. Obviously, all of this means that environmentalists consider this to be a lot of noise for nothing. Basically, a move that looked promising on paper but in practice only generated headlines, not any real viable alternatives away from aviation. And not only that, it is fully possible that some of the slots used for flights on those shorter routes that were actually affected could have already been handed over to destinations just further away. So in practice, the number of flights would be exactly the same, but some flights could be a little bit longer. Now you might think that because of this, the airlines wouldn't care much about this new law, but you would be wrong there. First of all, this is just the first version of the law and it already has a planned review date. French authorities will evaluate the effects of the law after three years and then they could decide to either remove it or make it more far-reaching, like banning flights if railways can cover them in three or even more hours. And if they would do that, this law could start to have some serious ramifications for the airlines. On top of that, like I said before, other countries could also decide to adopt similar laws, especially since the European courts have now shown that they wouldn't oppose it. Smaller EU countries with good rail links, like the Netherlands for example, are already reducing the number of flights from airports like Amsterdam for similar reasons as well as noise. But France is already working on another idea which could further hit the aviation industry, and that's minimum ticket prices. Late in August this year, the French transport minister said that he didn't think that tickets selling for only $10 were justified on environmental grounds. Now for anyone watching this outside of Europe, I should point out that a $10 price for an airline ticket over here might well be possible with some airlines, but it's absolutely not the norm. In any case, the French transport minister said that he is hoping to convince other transport ministers around Europe to adopt the minimum ticket price rule that could apply throughout the continent if that would happen. The idea here would be that since European courts didn't oppose the French short flight ban, they could well look favorably towards such a minimum ticket law as well. But I don't think it would be that simple. Because this time, the law isn't really benefiting the trains over airplanes, it's just making things more expensive. It could also be argued that this law simply targets low-cost carriers, favoring Air France and other more traditional airlines, and that would likely make it a lot harder for European and national courts to approve it. Such a law would make travel more expensive for the people who can least afford it, something that many airlines are very keen to point out. Plus, there are flights to places where there are no alternatives, like islands for example, and generally speaking, people working in places that rely on tourism really don't like regulations that make it harder for people to travel there. But what I think is really interesting is asking ourselves, does this even make any sense? If the aim is to discourage people from taking short flights and use the trains instead, why not make the trains cheaper and more attractive? That's actually what a lot of environmentalists in both France and in other countries are asking for. And even more to the point, why is train travel more expensive than air travel in the first place? Some consumer groups claim that planes emit 77 times more CO2 per passenger than trains do, although I am not so sure that that's an up-to-date comparison. These groups also claim that trains are cheaper, which 
they absolutely can be sometimes, but if train journeys were generally cheaper than air travel across Europe, well, then there wouldn't be a reason for setting minimum prices for air tickets in the first place, would there? Now, to be fair here, there really are moves in France and other European countries to boost railways and to make them more affordable. But at the moment, a lot of European railway companies are still either state-owned or they're private but run as localized monopolies, so the prices are staying high. Sweden, my home country, is a great example, where the government is working hard to convince people not to fly and instead take the train, but with the train becoming sometimes twice as expensive as flying and with huge problems with keeping on schedule. Nine times out of ten when I'm traveling home with my family, we actually end up having to take a rental car instead of the train, just because it's so expensive and that it can't be trusted. This is a complex issue, but in many places, this problem also has a lot to do with the railway network itself. Now, compared to many other countries worldwide, France has a quite good railway network, and obviously, this is a key reason to why they have this attitude towards aviation. They should have a good alternative to it, right? Well, the problem with rail networks is that they're not very flexible. Airlines can vary their schedule between different destinations during the summer and winter and even between weekdays and weekends based on demand. Railways can't really work that way, especially when it comes to city pairs that have an inconsistent demand. To get around this, railways basically rely on what we in the airline industry call the hub and spoke model, rather than connecting smaller destinations directly in what we would call the point to point model. What this means in practice is that even though France has a very complete railway network, it relies heavily on Paris being the country's main hub. That's a big reason why the short flights ban in France affected so few flights. With most trains routed through Paris, short flights between other French cities were mostly unaffected because trains just couldn't replace them. And that brings us to the trains in the United States. Now, this really applies to a lot of other countries as well, but I'm going to use the US as an example. In a recent video about Boeing, I briefly mentioned that there used to be a train line linking Boeing's Renton and Everett factories, but that it had been abandoned and parts of it turned into leisure parts for jogging and cycling instead. But what I didn't mention is that this was something that happened to a lot of older railway lines in the United States, as overly complicated networks were gradually merged, simplified or even abandoned. The problem is that even with these simplifications, the railway network that the United States have today is really geared towards carrying freight and not passengers. Now, I know that there are some exceptions to this for busy commuter routes in some parts of the US, but I think that it's fair to say that a ban on flights between city pairs that trains serve in under two and a half hours would not have much of an impact at all in the United States. So, just to recap. In France, even though the rail network is quite good, the authorities feel compelled to ban flights to help boost rail, and they're even considering minimum prices for flights, although it's debatable whether those minimum prices have to do with trains or if they're actually there to target low-cost airlines. But even if France's initiatives are successful, implementing the same ideas in the United States would be even harder, since a combination of missing high-speed rail or simply different priorities might make these moves completely ineffective. So, is there an alternative? Well, maybe. And this is where I'm going to come back to that idea of aircraft running on alternative energy sources. Now, before you start screaming at your TV or throw away your phone, yes, I know that I've spent the first 5-6 minutes of this video explaining how electric airplanes can't have the same impact for aviation that electric cars have had on the roads. That's because the energy density in the batteries for electric aircraft today is only good enough for small, two-seat trainers making relatively short flights. And actually, this is something that I've had the personal pleasure to try myself a while back, and I'll share that with you in a coming video. It was awesome. I love this. The, <laughs> you don't hear anything except for the prop sound. Yep. But the point here is that we're not going to see a purely battery-driven electric replacement for a Boeing 737 or an Airbus A320 for decades to come, if ever, unless energy density in batteries improves 50-fold or even more. And I know that Bjorn Ferm in Liham News is very skeptical, even when it comes to much smaller 20- and 30-seat electric or hybrid aircraft flying shorter distances just because they will be so much more expensive than their conventional fuel-driven counterparts. 
And that's because even though the fuel for those aircraft, which is electricity, is cheaper, the cost of replacing batteries will become hugely expensive over time. But other concepts with alternative fuels like hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen combustion aircraft are also coming. And those technologies are expected to start out and to be tested on smaller planes with relatively short range. That's pretty much exactly what you would use for the kind of flights that France is now banning. So a case could be made for focusing on this type of technology instead of banning flights. Obviously, these type of aircraft would work equally well on both sides of the Atlantic. And the US is a hugely attractive market for a lot of promising new projects working on turboprop sized aircraft. In previous videos, I've talked about how companies like Airbus, Universal Hydrogen, Zero Avia and others are working on this. And Hart Aerospace in Sweden recently joined the Regional Airline Association in the United States for this very reason. Hart are working on a 30-seat hybrid electric aircraft, which looks really interesting. And I'm hoping to show you more about that soon. Now, I know that critics will say that all of these projects will likely require a lot of public funding before becoming a reality. But in almost all parts of the world, railways will also need an equal, if not even bigger amount of funding. One way or another, we will ultimately need to make some real investments into the way that we travel, if we're ever going to make it greener in a sustainable way. My own personal view is that we in the airline business should definitely do our very best to become more green and more sustainable. But I think that lawmakers out there should focus their attention on the low hanging fruits that could make some real impact quickly, like sea shipping, for example. It is a huge engineering challenge to make an aircraft even tens of a percentage point more efficient or trying to find place inside of an aircraft structure to house a hydrogen tank. But there are plenty of space for hydrogen tanks on board container ships who are today running on diesel or even bunker oil, emitting up to 2000 times more sulfur than even normal diesel engines do. But of course, those thousands of container ships don't leave those white contrails above us, so they're easy to look away from and hard to score political points on. Now, I would love to hear what you think about this. Make sure that you have subscribed to the channel and let me know in the comments below. Now, check out these really cool videos next and consider supporting the channel by joining my Patreon crew, buying some merch or just screaming out in delight whenever I release a new video. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.